Viewers, you are welcome to my channel. In our previous lesson, we learned how to design analytical cost book in Excel. In this lesson, we are proceeding to link up the analytical cash book into the design of receipt and payment account. All right, so I'll go and share my analytical card book. And here we are. Already this sheet, the analytical card book sheet is complete. So we move on to the receipt and payment sheet. Our receipt and payment account, because this serve as the final report of our work, usually will be printed. So it requires us to provide the full details, which include the name of the organization and the title of the report. So in column, in rule A, that is rule one, provide the organization name here. So it's a name of organization. And the title of the report, which is receipt and payment account. That then your date will come. Now, one thing we should note in Excel is that the whole of this worksheet that we see here contains so many pages. So, anytime you are designing a report that you will be printing, you will have to set up the page very well so that you'll be able to ensure that the whole report fits on the page especially when it comes to the columns. So to, to know where a page is ending in a sheet, in a rest sheet, we click on the page layout. And when you come to the page layout, under the sheet options here, no, no, uh, from the page layout, um, you see grid lines, where is it? Okay, you see the grid lines that is under the sheet options. And at the moment, the grid lines is set to view. So you see when you click, you remove the check button from the view, the lines that were there are removed. Now by default, <clears throat> the grid lines is set to view, but it is not set to print. This means that when you print the report, these grid lines you see here will not come. The report will be printed without the grid lines, just like this. So it is set to view. The moment you opt to print the grid lines, immediately you see that the system will break the pages for you. And this line after column I indicates where the page will end. And as you go down to the rules, you also see where the first page of your report is going to end. It ends after rule 47. So in this case, our report, that is the receipt and payment account, it requires three columns. So we make sure that we set up the page here to contain the three columns. So I'll be opening the column A this column is going to contain the details of the accounts. Then I'll also open up the column B a little bit. This column will contain the debit entries and I'll open up the column C to give me the credit entries. So in effect, you will realize that the whole page has been um, reduced to three columns. Column A, which will be the accounts or the uh, containing the receipt and the payment accounts. The column B for our debit entries and column C for our credit entries. Now, 
I will start with my receipt account here. Then um, I will show my currency symbol by Ghana CDs for the debit entries. I will also show the another currency symbol for the credit entries. The accounts that we need under the receipt, they are already on the file sheet. As I explained earlier on, it is always better to maintain the same spelling of accounts. So as the accounts are already typed on the file sheet, I'll go there, copy and come and paste them. So I'll copy my income account. I'll copy my income account. These income accounts are going to be classified under the receipt. Then I will try, I'll just try to leave some space between the receipt and the payment. So I'll go and show my payment accounts also. These payment accounts include the expenses and as well as the assets. So I'll first of all, copy the expenses, paste them here and then go and copy the asset in addition. So these assets are also part of the payment account. Right. I'll go the pennies. Okay. Now, when it comes to the payment accounts, this payment account will be listed at the debit side here, and the receipt accounts will also be listed at the credit side. We are so fortunate to have these payment accounts calculated already on the analytical sheet. When you come to the analytical sheet, the totals we see here for each of the accounts constitute the balances for the payment accounts. And these balances are what we should transfer to the receipt and payment account. Now, these balances, you see here, they are listed horizontally, that is in the rule. But in the receipt and payment account, they are in one column, that is vertical. So the same thing here, we can copy and then transpose them. So copy and transpose here means that as we are copying from a rule in a horizontal form, we want to paste them in a vertical form. So here we see that we have to copy and transpose. So I'll go to the analytical sheet, highlight the balances for all the accounts, and I'll copy them. Um, we should also observe that if you look at the arrangement of the accounts, it's in the same order that we have them in this receipt and payment account. That is why we are able to do the copy and paste. If the order immediately changes, then it means that you cannot do that. Assuming that as a rent account is beginning, then in the receipt and payment account, you don't start with rent account, then you cannot apply this uh, copy and paste. In that case, you will have to do the linkage one by one. For instance, in front of rent, you put down the equal sign here, then go to the analytical sheet, you click on the balance for rent, then you hit the enter key. If the accounts are not arranged in the same order as they are arranged in the analytical sheet, then that will be the way you can go about to transfer the balances to the receipt and payment account. For instance, when it comes to the donation, you put down the equal sign here, you move to the analytical sheet, you look for donation account, and there's a balance. You click on that, then you hit the enter key. Now we are so fortunate that these uh, accounts are arranged in the same way or in the same order as they are arranged in the analytical sheet. So I will copy them. We highlight all the balances. We copy. Then when you get to the receipt and payment, we start with the rent. And this time we don't paste. If you paste, the balances will be pasted on a row but we don't want that. We want them to be pasted in a, in a column that is vertically. So instead of clicking on the paste icon, 
we rather go and use a transpose. So we click on this arrow, and then this is the transpose icon. We click on that. Now, with this, when you click on any of the balances, it will tell you where it is coming from. It is coming from the total of the rent column. So you see, we have some analytical range. So that is a rent column within the analytical table. Okay. Now, going on to the receipt column. You see, unlike the payment accounts, where we had columns for each one of them, when it comes to the, the receipt, we don't have columns for these accounts within the analytical sheet. So in this case, to be able to get the, the, the total receipt for each of the accounts, we will use a function which is called sum if function. So we are going to use the sum if function to be able to obtain the total receipt in respect for each of these accounts. So without wasting time, I would like to teach you how to apply the sum if function right. So let me create a new sheet to use it for illustration. We are going to learn the sum if function. See, so far, we've learned about the if function, which is the conditional statement, uh, which, is, which is used to analyze data in, in Excel. We have also at least applied the sum function, which is used to find the totals within a range, either on a row or in a column. Now, the, the new function we are going to learn is known as the sum if function. The syntax for the sum if function include the following. We have what you call range. We have what you call criteria. We have what you call sum range. These are the syntax for the sum if function. Now, let me try to illustrate the sum if function here for all of us. Let's suppose that we have a, a column containing list of items and another column containing the quantity of each of the items. So let's say we have pen, we have book, pen again, book, pencil, pencil, book, pen, Right, then we have the quantities. Right, assuming this is simply a sales system that recalls the quantity of the items we sell within a day or within a period, then at any point you want to find out the total for each of the items that we have sold so far. You are likely to have a very lengthy range or so many of them. You see this one, they are very few, just about 14 uh, times, but you are likely to have in over thousands, about 500 and others. So in this case, if you decide to go through it manually, to pick the item and add the corresponding quantity, it won't be an easy task. So this is where the sum if function comes in to help us. So if I want to find out the total for pen, then in this case, you see that I have two columns, column C and column D. So the, the meaning of the, 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 the range, to explain the range properly for you to understand it, I will first of all explain what the criteria means. The criteria here means that if as I want to find the total for pain, then when I'm going to include any of these values in my calculation, I'll bear in mind that it is pain that I'm looking for. So the, the, the criteria means the item within 
the I, or the, let's say the item I want to compute is total. So in this case, if I want to compute a total for pen, then pen becomes the criteria. That means that in the in the course of picking the values, I will only look out for pen. So this 23, which is for book, I will not consider it. Right. So that is the meaning of criteria. The range. The range is always the column where we can identify the criteria. So within these two columns, if my criteria is pen, then we look for where pen can be identified. And in this case, pen is identified in column C. So column C becomes my range. Then the sum range is the column that contains the values or the figures. So in this case, column D containing the quantities becomes the sum range. So if I want to apply the sum equation to give me the, quantity, the total of each item, for instance, pen, then I'll put in the equal sign, then my sum if bracket will be. You see, we have the range here. And with the range, I will come and pick the list of all items that have been sold. This give me column, that is C2 column C15. Then I bring comma. The next one is the criteria. I want to find out the total for pen. So I'll put in the pen within the function. You see, pen has been put into quotations and you know this is the double quotation because pen is not, um, it's a test, pen is a test. In every function, whenever you want to include a test, you have to put the test into quotation. That is why pen has been put into quotation. Then comma, my sum range, the sum range, I come and pick this column as well. Then when I finish, I'll hit the enter key and the system tells me that the total for pen is 186. If I want that of book, then it means I'll have to come and put book here and then hit the enter key. That gives me the total for book. Now, is it appropriate to be tapping the function and stating the name of the item? Though it is good, but sometimes it, it, it becomes it becomes not appropriate, especially where you have so many different items and you want to compute your tutors. You have to do it in such a way that when you finish one, you can drag instead of repeating formula for each item. So in this particular case, if assuming I want to find the total for each of the items, then I will have to just list them once at a particular column. So this time, book, pen, and pencil. I will not repeat any of them. Then in front of pen, I'll put in the function some if. Then I'll pick my range, comma. This time the criteria, instead of typing pen, I will just select the cell that contains pen. And in this case, pen is in cell H3. So the H3 here represent the content, which is pen. And that is the criteria. Then comma. Then I come and pick my sum range. Then I enter. You see, this has given me the same 186. So when I finish, we drag. In fact, this function I have typed is not correct. Though the function sum if has been used perfectly, but it wasn't done well. You see, um, when you type the function like this, you are likely to get the correct answer for only the first item, but subsequently, you are not likely to get it. Let me prove this to all of you. You see, the first item on the list represent pen. So you see the total is 186. And now you see the total for book being 192. Should I change the first item on the list to also book? Then you should all expect that this quantity should come down and this quantity for book should go up. So let me see. You see, by changing the first item to book, you see, it, it only affected the first pen tutor, but it did not affect the tutor for book. That is why I said that the function that I typed wasn't typed well. So in order to uh, get a correct output all the time, whenever you change 
any of the items within the range, then we, we say that you will have to make the, the range and the sum range or absolute. Don't leave them as relative as it, as it was. So um, I'll pick my range and I'll make it absolute. To make it absolute implies you have to hit the F4 key on your keyboard. This F4 key, uh, those of us who will be using laptops, sometimes you will need to use the function key, the Fn, before you hit the F4. If it is a normal keyboard, the function key F4, when you just press it, it will convert the range to absolute reference. And you see that the C2 comes at $C, $2, $C, $15. This is absolute. Then comma. And this time, my criteria, which is H3, comma, and my sum range, which is the quantity column. I'll come and pick this also. And this also requires to be set to absolute. Now, when I hit the enter key and then do my dragging, you see that um, should I change the first item to book? You see immediately the pen quantity has reduced to 166, and the book quantity has also gone up to 212. And this is the correct way the sum e function is supposed to be used, especially. When you have to drag the formula, you have to make the range and the sum range absolute, leaving the criteria relative. You see, the criteria is, is maintained as relative so that when you drag it down, as pen is classified in H3, when you move on to the next item, which is book, the H3 will now go up to become H4 in order to represent book. But if you make it also absolute, then at the end, you, it means you are only calculating total for pen alone, not for the others. So let's see. You see, when you drag, it gives you only the total for pen because the criteria to has made absolute. So always you make sure your criteria is set to relative reference, but the range and the sum range all should be set to what? absolute reference. Okay, so this is how the sum e function is used in Excel. Now, we are going to apply this same sum e function to obtain the totals for each of these accounts from the analytical cash book. Now, if you look, if you come here, if you come into the analytical cash book, the, assuming we are receiving donation, you put the amount being received at the receipt column and as donation, this time donation income. So I'll pick my income account and I'll go and pick donation account. Right. So this is telling us that the account names as they are listed here, the account name as they are listed here, which in this case is going to serve as our criteria. When you get into the analytical sheet, they are contained under a column called account. So that means that our range is going to be the column known as the account. Now the values that will be adding up, you, know, you see by the end, by the time we finish our recordings, you have so many values going down here. So the values that will be, will be, will be summing up will also be found under the receipt column. So this is, this is telling us that the range will be the account column and the criteria will be, the sum range will be the receipt column. While the criteria will be the first cell for the first item, which is A5, right? Um, we are so fortunate because this, uh, the range and the sum range, they are contained in a particular table. And the table is what you call the analytical table. When you come into the analytical sheet and you want to find out the name of the table, you see, uh, as I, I explained to you the last time, when you are within the table, you will see this design ribbon. When you go out of the table, the design ribbon disappears, right? So when I go into the table and click on the design, you'll be able to identify 
the table name. And this time, the name of the table is called Analytica. So as I know the table name, I can easily stay on the receipt and payment sheet and still get access to my range and my sum range. So I will start with my equal sign, then the sum if function, I'll open a bracket. The range, this time instead of going there to drag it, I will rather type everything here. The range is coming from the analytical table. So I'll mention the name of the table A and A, and you see that the analytical table is found here. I will double click on it. When you select the table, you open the square bracket, and when you do that, you see all the columns within the table. And as I said, the account column is going to serve as the range. So that is where we will go to see these items. So I'll pick my account and close the square bracket. So this is the range. After that, comma. My criteria, I'll just click on this item, giving me a five. That is a criteria. Then comma. Then my sum range, I will also type in the table name, Analytica. And with my open bracket, that is a square bracket, the sum range is the receipt. Sorry, the sum range is the receipt. So I close my square bracket and the round bracket. So this is how the sum if function is used to obtain the totals for each of these accounts from the receipt and payment uh, from the analytical sheet. Okay, so press the enter key. You see these values are already converted to accounting, but this is just general number, so it's zero, right? So to convert it to accounting value, accounting value comes with the comma separation and the decimal portion without the currency symbol. If, if you click on this dollar sign, it comes with the currency symbol. You see the dollar symbol is there. If you go and pick the accounting also from here, if you pick the accounting from the from the Dropbox, it also gives you the currency symbol. But if you don't need a currency symbol in your report, you only have to uh, select the, the comma. So when you click on this comma, it becomes dash because our currency is already in Ghana cities. So we are not supposed to select the accounting from here to get another currency symbol. So in this case, I will just click on the comma. Then when I'm done, I will drag it up to the IGF. So I have gotten the transfer done. You realize that in the analytical sheet, I gave an example of a receipt of 200 in respect to donation. And you see that that particular 200 has been appear, is appearing here. Right. Now, the next to do is to come out with the totals. So we need to get a total receipt and we need to get a total payment so that we can uh, find a difference to, give, to represent the balance. So before I get my total, I will have to underline the last item being the IGF. So I'll have to underline this and the, the total will have to come below the line. With the total, we can use this, the, the auto sum, you see? The auto sum is there. So we're using the auto sum all the time. You highlight the values you want to add and you extend it to where you want the total to appear. As I want the total to appear in row 10, I'll extend the selection to row 10. This is what you call the auto sum. See? So when I click on the auto sum, it is giving me the total, which is derived by the sum function. Right, okay. Then I go down to get the total for the payment accounts. And with this also, I will have to underline the last the, the last account balance. Then uh, this time the total will not come below the line. The total will have to come here. Because the total is not going below the line, I can't use the auto sum. 
So I will only have to type in equal to sum bracket, and then I will pick all these balances, press down the enter key, and I've gotten the total for all my payment. Then this time too, I underline it. Then just below the line, I'll get my balance. So the balance, that is the balance at the end, come here. And this balance should be the total of the receipt minus the total of the payment. So that is the total below the line here and then minus total above the line here, which is C10 minus C23. I accept this and end my report with the double line. So this is how the receipt and payment account is also designed. Now, this receipt and payment account, it is an output sheet. As an output sheet, no entries are made here. The only thing you can do over here is the setting of the name of the organization and the, and the report title as well as the date. So if you design it for your organization, you initially type the organization name here. Then for the date, anytime you are going to print the report, you have to come and set the date, then you print it. Okay. Now, um, this particular system we have designed, it is possible that you will be using it period to period. For instance, in your institution, you can decide to present your report at the end of every month, or maybe at the end of every quarter, half yearly or yearly. So in this case, assuming you are to report every month, then you have to start with a fresh system at the beginning of every month. Now that you have designed this particular uh, sheet, do you have to redesign any time you are beginning a new month or a new period? The question is no. What you can do is that when you set up um, any worksheet, any workbook for your, for, your, for your office, you will have to save it as a template so that in the subsequent periods, you will only have to go and open the template. And then when you open the template, it gives you a fresh system to work with. So I'm going to teach you how to save a template. Now, at any time you are to save a template, one thing you should note is that the template should not contain any record. You make sure you save it when the system is empty. Now you could see that I just recorded some entry in the analytical sheet. So I will have to remove this before I can save the template. So I remove the entries within the report before I can save the template. So I have to remove everything. See now the system is empty. There is no records in it. Now to save the template, you click on the file sheet, uh, click on file from the top. From file, you go to save us. Save us is here. At the initial stage, you can choose any location, right? I'm choosing desktop to save my template, right? Then when you come here, the, type, the, the file name will be there and the save as type is also here. So the save, save as type is here. This is Excel workbook, but we are going to change this to Excel template. Before we do that, you see we selected that to save it on the desktop. See desktop is here. But the moment you choose to save it as a template, the system will change the location. Microsoft ha has created a folder where all templates by default go there. So if you are not aware of that and you choose to save it as a template, you may think that you are saving your template on the desktop. By the time you finish, you go there and you can see the template. So you let's see. When I change the save as type to Excel template, here is Excel template. You see that the folder has changed from document to custom office template. 
which means that when I finish saving, I can't find this on the desktop. This will be on the, this will be at the, what do you call it? Uh, custom office template, right? So what I need to do is to uh, make, go back and reselect the storage location. So I will choose my desktop again, and this time click on save, right? After saving your template, you will have to, um, how do you call it? You will have to close it and reopen. The reason is that for now, whatever you type, it, it, it will be part of the template. So if you decide to record entries immediately after saving the template, the following period, you may think of opening the template for a new, to, for a new start. You go and see those records there. So what you need to do is that immediately you um, you save any template, you close it first, then you reopen, right? You close and reopen. Now, um, after closing, I'm going to share it once again, right? Okay, coming. So. I will have to open the template, right? So you close it first, as I said, then you will open it again before you start recording your entries. So I'm going to record some few entries with you and to see how the whole system is working. Right. I have this few transactions that I would like to report for you. Let's say at the start of the period, we have a bank statement balance of 5,450. That is the month of uh, January 2019. So bank statement balance of 5,450. So I'll put my 5,450 at the receipt column because this is a balance. So the date, 1st January 2019, right. Details for the transaction, I can say uh, bank balance. Then when I go into the account class, I will choose my income. No, the balance brought down was classified under the income and I will choose my balance brought down. So this is how the first entry is recorded. You could see this immediately on your receipt and payment, right? Good. Now the next transaction, say grant received from allied agencies, 36,000 on January 3rd. So I will just come here. You see the table only, con only appears on row eight, but the moment I type my date, the table will extend there automatically. So January 3rd, that is, um, you see, the date format, my date format for the computer is month, day, year. So if, as my date format is month, day, year, that means I will have to type in the month first before the day and before the month. So if my date here is January 3rd, then I will have to type in the month first, January, and the day, third and in the, the year. In Excel, the date format of your computer is what you should use to enter date within the Excel. So as my date format is um, month, day, year, then I'll have to type the date following that month, day, year. If your date format is date, month, year, then in that case, you will have to type 3-1-2019. But mine is month, day, year. So it's January 3rd, 2019. All right. Now this is grant received. So detail, you can type grant received. Because you could receive grant from so many places, you need to tell us where it is coming from. And you need to come out with your full details of the transaction. Then this is also income. Then come and select the grant account here. Good. 
the amount for that receipt, 36,000. Good. The next one says payment of rent advance for the first quarter, 1,500. And this is on the January 5th. January 5th. So this is January 5th, 2019. This is rent advance for first quarter. Uh, rent advance for first quarter, which is a payment of 1,500. So I put the amount in the payment column. This is an expense. And I choose a rent account. Okay, so this, the column is too small to accommodate the amount. So I just have to open them right. Now, so far we have total receipt of 41,450, total payment of 1,500, balance of 39,950. Okay, the next entry on the January 7th, donations received from Black Stars. So I'll go here. You can, I can put the amount received, which is 25,000. And then the date, which is a uh, 7th of January. So January 7th, donation from Black Stars. And this is income account, income account. And I choose my donation account here. Right. One thing you, 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 could, you could observe is that you see donation accounts it here is an income as well as an expense. So because this particular donation we have recorded is an income, the value is here. And under the uh, under the expenses column, see the place is dash. All right. The place is dash. But if I had put the value at the payment that value will have appeared under the donation. Okay. Then we have pictures of motor vehicle on the 17th of January. Okay, okay, I've, I've jumped, I've skipped one. See, fundraising organized by the society. So there is fundraising. So this is the, the organization's own internal generator fund. So the fundraising and the amount that, or the proceed from it, is 18,700, so 18,700, that is also an income. And this is January 14th. I'll pick my income account once again. And this one, I'll pick the IGF, Internet Generated Fund. Okay, on the 17th, purchase of motor vehicle, 20,000. So 17th, I'll put down my date here, January 17th, purchase of motor vehicle, 20,000 as a payment. I'll pick, the motor vehicle is classified under asset. So I'll pick my asset and I'll pick my motor vehicle. Right, so this is a few entries I would like to record for you. And as you go on, you'll be getting your totals and you'll be getting your balances. When you move into the receipt and payment, you'll come and see that all these are there, right? And, uh, and the payment side too, you see they are all there, right? Let's suppose uh, you pay additional rent. How will the system take it? See, because rent has been paid only once, the amount is 1,005. Let's assume additional rent is paid. So let's assume that on the, the, on the 18th of January, you pay another rent. So you, you decide to pay another rent. So you say rent paid, let's say 2,000. This is also an expense. And you choose a rent account. So by the time you get there, you see the rent total has now become 3,005, okay? Good. Now the same way, if you receive another, if you get another receipt, maybe for the nation once again, that will also go up. If you receive another grant, then the grant total will also go up. 
So that is how this system is worked. Right. This is the end of the preparation of analytical cash book and the receipt and payment account. And if you have any question, you can contact me on my, um, you can send your questions through my email and the email account is um, And also call on my line for any clarification. Then uh, on my WhatsApp line, um, 0260 Nine three nine three one five. Okay. All right. So this the first the second one is my WhatsApp account. You can send your questions through WhatsApp and now I'll, I'll explain to you further or you can send your questions through my email j a j a m a f r i m p at yahoo.co.uk you can also send your questions through the email all right thank you very much